Hello and welcome to Fireside Fairy Tales. If you've never been here before, well then welcome. This is Varietal Literature's YouTube page. <clears throat> it's just a little corner of the internet for narrative. And what we do here on Tuesday nights, 6.30 my time, Pacific, is we uh, read old folklore and fairy tales together live with some sound effects and, well, some chat if you want to chat to people about what's going on in the story. Which is the advantage if you are watching this live. You can join the live chat. You do need an account from YouTube, but uh, if you have that, you can join the live chat. It's already occupied by uh, what I call my little crop of potatoes, a name that they've never accepted, but I have imposed. Um, and in there I see um, <clears throat> Uncle Kitty, Tammy Morelli, Jum's Store, GS, uh, Zombie Wolf, that's all for now, but, um, <clears throat> um, and, uh, they're, ta they're talking about their, um, well, their lives so far, because people come and join up in the chat a lot. That's the benefit of watching this live. The benefit to not watching it live is if you're bored out of your mind right now, and they're like, when is this guy going to tell a story? Down in the description below, there will be timestamps that can allow you to jump ahead to the beginning of whatever tale interests you. And if you're interested in just finding out about the... <clears throat> Cinderella story. Uh, it's called Nip It Fit It, Nip It Fit, and Clip It Fit. Uh, and it will be tagged in the description below with a timestamp. You can click on that, it takes you to the beginning. I'm going to do a little introduction, a little explanation why I chose the stories I did tonight. Uh, but um, yeah, that's the gist of it. Join the live chat if you're live, and if you're not live, skip over whatever doesn't interest you. <clears throat> um, I see, oh, Thorny Rose is here. Hello, Thorny Rose. Well, it is sometimes jump store. Anyways, um, uh, the um, let me tell you a little bit about uh, tonight's tales. They don't have too much of a thematic link between them. Um, the first one, as I said, is basically a Scottish Cinderella tale. But, <clears throat> and to answer questions, I, I didn't have a chance to uh, track down the tea you recommended, jump store. This is just good old fashioned Earl Grey. Um, oh, and Lizzie Rose is here. Hello, Lizzie. Thank you for uh, coming back. I enjoyed your comments on my last video. I, I, I like that as well. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the short version is, um, these tales have, uh, cultural links in common, uh, cultural links that I share. Uh, but anyways, <clears throat> If you know a decent bit about folk folklore, I just need to sort of address the elephant in the room. What do I mean by grim, if the title is still the same? Um, uh, what is the horror of, horror of the Scottish Cinderella and stuff? And I'm going to let the story tell itself, but I don't want to oversell it. It's not like a gruesome Saw-like story in actuality. For the most part, it is basically a Cinderella story. You will recognize that it has the crystal shoe and all of that kind of structure to it. However, <clears throat> if you know a decent bit about folklore, you know that the quote-unquote original versions of fairy tales of folklore often do include dark or grim aspects that are edited out, late, edited out later by modern adaptations, sometimes for good reason. Sometimes it's sort of nonsense to include them. <clears throat> Tammy says you need some sleepy time, Rory. T, Rory. I need to perform for an hour and a half. I don't want to be sleepy. Um, <clears throat> I will say, though, on the whole, it is my opinion, after reading quite a few different collections of folklore, that this aspect, the sort of grim, dark nature of folklore and fairy tales in its original formats, uh, is overstated. I don't think that's quite true. I think that is true for some things. I think in general folklore is weirder and more unstructured than modern tales and adaptations of those tales. But it's not really generally more violent or tragic or horrible or whatever else. What I think informs that specific perspective is the Grimm brothers, who are of course collectors of German folklore. Um, but the Grimm brothers seem to understand the Grimm brothers collect a bunch of versions of a tale from the German countryside. And then when they put their books out, they would sort of select a version to highlight 
as the one cohesive version with some editing and and input on themselves to make it accessible to their audience. And then in their footnotes, they'd note all these variations. And they usually picked the most grim and gruesome versions of those tales. That's a Grim Brother thing, which it occurs to me might be why are the word grim is being applied, but that's probably not true. It's probably just coincidence. Anyways, <clears throat> um, but at, that serves as a reminder that there are no quote unquote original versions of folklore, or if there is, they're long lost to us. Um, the Grimm brothers don't represent some starting point or some more accurate version of a story than the adaptations that came later. They're just different. They made their own choices about which version they wanted to highlight and pass down in writing. To favor it, that's fine, but it's just a preference. It's, it, there's no real historical significance to doing that over favoring one of the many other lesser known German folklore collectors that were not so obsessed with the grimdark aspects of folklore. Um, <clears throat> However, what does any of this have to do with the tale tonight? Well, just because, you know, the reputation is that all folklore is grim, I wanted to put up front if this is a person's, like, first encounter of this stuff. It's not all like this. Uh, if you're looking for some sort of uh, uh, disguised version of a, a horror canon in folklore, that's not true. However, now and then, folklore includes things that are pretty grim, for no real obvious reason, although there is a thematic reason in this version of Cinderella why this is included. Uh, and again, I'm not giving it away because I want the story to tell you, but it is something you've probably heard before. If you're a person who's looked into the original versions, it's not going to be that much of a surprise because uh, I had heard it before. I've just never actually found an original collected tale that had this version of Cinderella. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to put that up front. Not all folklore is grimmer than its modern adaptations. Some of it's a lot more lighthearted than its modern adaptations. But this one isn't. <laughs> um, it is in many ways just a Cinderella tale. And then there's just this detail that I think is mostly there is almost like a joke. But uh, it doesn't land with a modern audience, me. Um, uh, the... Um, the next thing I'm going to say is that what connects this tale and the other tale that I'm going to read tonight called uh, Asapadal and the Mester Storm is that they're both Scottish. Although, I mean, they are both Scottish. But in particular, the second story is a, a founder's tale of sorts that could be claimed by many subcultures of Gaelic and Nordic people. Because, and I think North Americans who aren't too good at geography might not know this, the distinction between Scotland and the Norse people is very relatively small amount of water and in many ways they were combined and probably there's no better example of that than the Orkney Isles which is in northern Scotland there are a little patch of islands that for a long time were Norwegian in nationality and people and then about 500 years ago were switched back to Scotland for a variety of political the Lord's brother did this and whatever reasons and uh, my interest in reading uh, both these tales, but in particular, this second tale um, is uh, my, uh, what, at least one side of my family tracks pretty directly back to the Orcadians or the people of the Orkney Isles. And so I'm interested in them as a culture, given that apparently my grumpy family comes from them. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so... Uh, what ties these two together is they're two Scottish classics. Um, probably the second one more than the first, but I think the first is going to be the more recognizable one, except for some details. I also particularly enjoy that uh, when I read Scottish folklore, maybe I'm just looking at clouds and seeing she shapes, but they remind me of family members and the details that differentiates it from like a German folklore, the things it chooses to talk about. I'm like, eh, that sounds like my uncle. Um, <clears throat> John Storis says, have you seen the German's children's book that's supposed to teach the morals or something? I can't remember the title right off the top of my head. I mean, that was about 50% of children's books at that time, I imagine. 
Uh, I do know that they were pretty explicit about their morals. And yeah, Lizzie Rose highlights that. Charles Perrault, who I've read a bunch of stuff, he has, he has many collections of folklore from around the turn of the century, had one of those morals were outright stated at the end, which wasn't particularly unusual when you were targeting a young, broader audience. Yeah, me neither, <laughs> Tammy. <laughs> I'm not going to try to pronounce it. A name was suggested. Um, <coughs> anyhow, Janera says, the title makes me think of the Grimm Brothers Cinderella. I think it shares some gruesomeness with that version as well. Yeah. Um, but we're going to see. It's a little bit different. It's a little bit more Scottish, to be honest. Uh, and we'll see what you guys think of it. You'll see if you think it adds something to the story or not, because I'm not sure that it does. I think it's a little bit distracting, the gruesome aspects it adds. Um, but then the second story is a proper epic, a founder's tale. And, uh, well, it could, as I said, could be related to many different cultures. It is at least relevant to the Orcadian people of which I descend from. <clears throat> okay. That's enough of my blabbity blab. We actually have a fair bit of reading tonight. Because if there's one thing Scottish people do well, it's talk. <laughs> Come to a family dinner. Either no one's talking to anyone because there's grudges. Or they're all talking and you can't stop them. <laughs> all right. Our first tale is about... is in Scotland, of course, so there's going to be rain. <clears throat> Our first tale tonight comes to us from the Scottish Fairy Book, a collection that you can get for free on um, Project Gutenberg, uh, which is a collection of Scottish folklore and fairy tales. Uh, from the turn of the century, I believe. And um, <clears throat> the first tale we're reading from it is a rendition of Cinderella with a bit of a grim aspect. So if you have very young kids, you may not want them to hear this version. <laughs> um, uh, called Nip It Fit and Clip It Fit, which is indicative of what's grim about it. In a country far across the sea, there once dwelt a great and mighty prince, and he lived in a grand castle which was full of beautiful furniture and curious and rare ornaments, and among them was a lovely little glass shoe which would only fit the tiniest foot imaginable. And as the prince was looking at it one day, it struck him what a dainty little lady she would need to be who wore such a very small shoe, and as he liked dainty people. He made up his mind that he would never marry until he found a maiden who could wear the shoe and that when he found her, he would ask her to be his wife. Put that in your Tinder profile. What's your shoe size? <laughs> what a thin. Also, will you marry me? <clears throat> and he called all his lords and courtiers to him and told them of the determination that he'd come to and asked them to help him in his quest. And after they'd taken counsel together, they summoned a trusty knight and appointed him the prince's ambassador and told him to take the slipper and mount a fleet-footed horse and ride up and down the whole of the kingdom until he found a lady whom it would fit. So the ambassador put the little shoe carefully in his pocket and set out on his errand. And he rode and he rode and he rode, going to every town and castle that came in his way and summoning all the ladies to appear before him to try on the shoe. And as he caused a proclamation to be made that whoever could wear it should be the prince's bride, I need not tell you that all the ladies in the countryside flocked to wherever <clears throat> the ambassador chanced to be saying, staying rather, and begged leave to try on that slipper. 
But they were all disappointed, for not one of them, try as she would, could make her foot small enough to go into that fairy shoe. And there were many bitter tears shed in secret. And when they returned home by countless fair ladies <clears throat> who prided themselves on the smallness of their feet and who had set out full of lively expectations that they should would be the successful competitors. At last, the ambassador arrived at a house where a well-to-do lord had lived. But the lord was dead now, and there was nobody left but his wife and two daughters who had grown poor of late and who had to work hard for their living. And one of the daughters was haughty and insolent, and the other was little and young and modest and sweet. And when the ambassador rode into the courtyard of this house... <coughs> And holding out the shoe, asked if there were any fair ladies there who would like to try it on. The eldest sister, who always thought a great deal of herself, ran forward and said that she would do so. And well, the younger girl just shook her head and went on with her work. For, she said to herself, so my feet are so little that they might go into the slipper. What would I do as the wife of a great prince? Folk would just laugh at me and say that I was not fit for the position. No, no. I am far better to bide as I am. Which, by the way, is just something about ten people in my family could say. I don't know if that's a Scottish-specific thing, but that's what it resonated to me as. <laughs> oh, I couldn't be a prince anyways. So the ambassador gave the glass shoe to the elder sister who carried it away to her own room and presently to everyone's astonishment came back wearing it on her foot. It is true that her face was very white, whiter than it had been before, and that she walked with a bit of a limp. But no one noticed these things except her younger sister and she only shook her wise little head and said nothing. The prince's ambassador was delighted that he had la last found a wife for his master and he mounted his horse and he rode off at full speed to tell him the good news. And when the prince heard of the success of his errand, he ordered all the courtiers to be ready to accompany him the next day when he went to bring home his bride. You can fancy what excitement <clears throat> there was at the lord's house when the gallant company arrived with their prince at the head and to greet the lady who was to be their princess while the old mother and the plain looking maid of all work ran hither and thither fetching such meat and drink as the house could boast to set before their high-born visitors and when the bonny little sister and <clears throat> went and hid herself behind a great pot which stood in the corner of the courtyard and which was used for boiling hen's meat there's a lovely little drawing i'll let you absorb for a moment while i have some water <clears throat> she knew that her foot was the smallest in the house and something told her that if the prince once got a glimpse of her he would not be content till she had tried on that slipper meanwhile the selfish elder sister did not help at all but ran up to her, <clears throat> her chamber and decked herself out in all the fine clothes that she possessed before she came downstairs to meet the prince when all the knights and courtiers had drunk a stirrup cup and wished good luck to their lord and his bride <clears throat> She was lifted up behind the prince on his horse and rode off so full of her own importance that she even forgotten to say goodbye to her mother and sister. A 
Alas, alas, pride must have a fall. For the cavalcade had not proceeded very far when a little bird, which was perched on a branch of a bush by the roadside, sang out, Nip it fit and clip it fit behind the king rides, but pretty fit and little fit, a hint the cauldron hides. What is this, the bird, he says, cried the prince, who, if true be, truth be told, did not feel altogether satisfied with the bride whom fortune had bestowed upon him. Hast thou another sister, madam? Uh, only a little one, murmured the lady, who liked ill the way in which things seemed to be falling out. I'll go back and find her, said the prince firmly, for when I set out the slipper I had no mind that its wearer should nip her foot and clip her foot in order to get it on. And so the whole party turned back, and when they reached the lord's house, the prince ordered a search be made of the courtyard, and when bonny little sister was soon discovered and brought out, all blushes and confusion from her hiding place behind the cauldron. Give her the slipper and let her try it on, said the princess, and the eldest sister was forced to obey. And what was the horror of the bystanders as she drew it off to see she had cut the tops of her toes in order to get it in. But it fitted her little sister's foot exactly without either paring or clipping and when the prince saw that it was so he lifted the elder sister down from his horse and lifted the little one up in her place and carried her home to his palace where the wedding was celebrated with great joyce rejoicing <clears throat> and for the rest of their lives they were the happiest couple in the whole kingdom Right. Uh, I suppose I should have seen this coming, but the chat is talking exclusively about the size of feet, their feet, and OnlyFans. So I'm going to move on. <laughs> um, <clears throat> GS says nothing has changed. We still hop and talk for beauty. That's a good point. I didn't take it that way. Um, it is particularly interesting. So I know that now that you know what the, the sort of twist of it is, I know that the chopping of, um, um, I know how the chopping of toes is not like a Scottish invention for this story. I have seen that in other tales. I think it's in the Grimm Brothers version, but if, if, it, if I'm misremembering, it's definitely in other versions. But it's not common. Cinderella doesn't always have that. Also, Cinderella, by the way, is an interesting connection to the next tale in the name um <clears throat> you'll see in the um gs says tammy is our princess now oh is tammy have the smallest feet of the chat uh lizzie rose uh likes how we do voices well thank you lizzie it's very kind of you um apparently it reminds me of my mom's readings well i'm glad because if i'm being honest that was always my perspective uh, you know, I don't feel like I can compete to with the professional storytellers, you know, uh, very well. But I felt like I, I one thing that I I remembered in particular was my dad reading me The Hobbit when I was young. And uh, I think I go for that vibe. <clears throat> Anyways, um, in some cases, like the cho toes are chopped entirely off and whatever else and i guess it makes sense like there is a sort of logical through line that if if you just had to lose some toes and then you're a princess um um then uh then that's probably worth it if you're a peasant to be honest like what are your toes doing you don't have to walk <clears throat> Uh, Lizzie Rose says, Grim has one sister chopped her toes off and the other chopped off some heel. That I do remember. I may have even read that version before, but if I did, it was like three years ago. Because um, I did cover some classics in the beginning. But um, uh, it is, I think, something about this one stood out to me because it's not necessary for any real aspect of the story it's mostly just there as almost like a punchline. Not a funny punchline, but as a punchline for the story, as a reveal. 
Uh, and it's such a gruesome one. <laughs> um, Uncle Kitty says they think the prince. Do the, I guess do they never think the do they think the prince will never notice? Um, well, I think marriage was a lot more binding. Although you know, I guess if you're the king, you got away with a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, Lizzie Rose says if you're a princess, you ain't gonna watch much. No, exactly. Uh, okay. <clears throat> That's nip it fit and clip it fit, and what it's about is nipping and clipping your foot to fit very tiny glass slippers. It is also interesting that he, he likens it to a fairy shoe in there, but it's never actually explicitly said to be magical, or nor is a source given. So, if you already knew the Grimm Brothers version or whatever of the story, then this probably wasn't very surprising, but if it if you didn't, you should know that in many versions of Cinderella, um, toes get hacked off. Sometimes by the stepmother to the resistance of the daughters. Usually by the daughters themselves, though. And I'll be honest, the stepmother doing it to her own daughters to be rich and famous feels more accurate in a way. <laughs> Uncle Kitty's like the honeymoon. Well, let's get a look at Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay. Uh, it is actually a rather involved tale, this one. So I will not waste too much time getting to it. I don't want to go too long. <laughs> um, but um, I do feel like I might be mispronouncing this word, but I really couldn't find uh, a satisfactory source for pronouncing it. Uh, Asapatl, as it will describe in this story, Asapatl is sort of a description of a boy who spends his time in the ashes of a fire. Now, this is interesting. I'll take off the weather sounds for a moment. This is interesting to me for a pretty specific reason. Cinderella has a similar meaning. Uh, cinder refers to being sort of around the ashes of a fireplace and Ella being kind of like a female or a girl. So it's like a, a cinder girl. And cinder girls were sort of lowly um, servants who swept up the ashes or, uh, you know, hung around the low ends of the fire. They were sort of the lowest of the low. Um, and we talked about as Bjornsson, and I'm forgetting the exact word he uses, but he gives a name that is very similar to sort of Ash Boy, in his versions of tales, and here in the Scottish fairy book, Asabhaddle is a sort of reference to a boy who hangs out in the ashes. And last week, we had a tale from... Might have been Scottish as well? It's Celtic. Irish. It was Irish, that's right. Celtic, but... Um, <clears throat> where uh, it was a, a boy was uh, a described his feet in ashes because he hung around with his feet in the ashes um and i find that interesting uh because it is a hard thing for me as a modern reader to really put a context on it obviously is meant to give a lot of explanation as to the character of these people and their status in society and as much as it's explained to me i feel like there's a lot of nuance missed in this case in asa paddle's case I think you can take it, and you'll see this throughout the story, as being the kid who sits in front of the TV and reads a lot of comic books. Um, what I'm trying to say is Asa Paddle is a story about me. <laughs> you'll see what I mean when we get into it. Yes, says YouTube is claiming there's only one person in chat. Oh, I don't know. YouTube's been really weird lately. Um, YouTube has been... Um, uh, it's showing me zero, by the way. I usually have the viewers hidden, but I just checked. Uh, you, YouTube um, has been doing this thing where it gives views to a video, and then two days later, they're gone. I don't know what that's about. <laughs> I'm not SEO optimized content, so whatever. It is what it is. I'm glad to have uh, uh, the little crowd that I do. <clears throat> okay. 
Our second and final story of the night also comes from the Scottish fairy book, and it is called Essa Paddle and the Mester Storeworm. And it is a very iconic traditional Scottish tale associated to, well, Scottish and Nordic cultures and the Orkney Isles, which is my interest of it. And it functions as a founder's tale. So in the end, there is a twist that I find very interesting. <clears throat> In far bygone days in the north, there lived a well-to-do farmer who had seven sons and one daughter. And the youngest of these seven sons bore a very curious name. For men called him Asaparo, which means he who gravels among the ashes. Now perhaps Asaparo deserved his name, for he was a rather lazy boy he never did any work on the farm as his brothers did but ran about the doors with ragged clothes and unkempt hair and whose mind was ever filled with wondrous stories of trolls and giants elves and goblins and when the sun was hot in the long summer afternoons and when the bees droned <coughs> drowsily and even the tiny insects seemed almost asleep the boy was content to throw himself down on the ash heap among the amongst the ashes and lie there, lazily letting them run through his fingers as one might play with sand on the seashore, basking in the sunshine and telling stories to himself. So, Rory, in other words. And his brothers, working hard in the fields, would point to him with mocking fingers and laugh and say to each other how well the name suited him and of how little use he was in the world. And when they came home from their work, they would push him about and tease him, and even his mother would make him sweep the floor and draw water from the well and fetch peats from the peat stack and do all the little odd jobs that nobody else would do. So poor Asapaddle had a rather a hard life of it, and he would often have been a very miserable had it not been for his sister, who loved him dearly, and who would listen quite patiently to all the stories that he had to tell, who never laughed at him or told him that he was telling lies as his brothers did. But one day a very sad thing happened. At least it was a sad thing for poor Asapaddle. For it chanced that the king of these parts had only one daughter, the princess Jemda Lovely, whom he loved dearly and to whom he denied nothing. And Princess Jemda Lovely was in want of a waiting maid. And as she had seen as a paddle sister standing by the garden gate as she was riding by one day and had taken a fancy to her, she asked her father if she might ask her to come and live at the castle and serve her. And her father agreed at once, as he always did agree to any of her witches, and sent a messenger in haste to the farmhouse to ask if his daughter would come to the castle to be the princess's waiting maid. And of course, the farmer was very pleased at the piece of good fortune which had befallen the girl, and so was her mother. And so were her six brothers, all except poor Asapaddle, who looked with wistful eyes after his sister as she rode away, proud of her new clothes and of the riddlins which her father had made her out of cowhide, which she was to wear in the palace when she waited on the princess, for at home she always ran barefoot. Riddlins is a type of footwear. Time passed. One day a rider rode in hot haste through the country, bearing the most terrible tidings. For the evening before, some fishermen <clears throat> out in their boats caught sight of the Mester Storeworm, which, as everyone knows, was the largest and the first and the greatest of all the sea serpents. It was the beast which in the good book, the Bible, if you don't know, is called the Leviathan. And if it had been measured in our day, 
seas. Its tail would have touched Iceland, while its snout rested on the North Cape of Scotland. And the fishermen had noticed that this fearsome monster had its head torn towards the mainland and that it opened its mouth and yawned horribly as if to show it was hungry. When it says yawned here, it means like opening its mouth. It uses this phrase a lot. In modern times, we only mean it really to be sleepy. They are not saying the sea serpent is sleepy. It's just a bit of an anachronistic use of it. It's not wrong even, but it's just not a common use of it. <coughs> As if to show that it was hungry, and that if it were not fed, it would kill every living thing upon the land, both man and beast, bird and creeping thing. For twas well known that its breath was so poisonous that it consumed as with a burning fire everything that it lighted on. So that if it pleased the awful creature to lift its head and put forth its breath like noxious vapor over the country in a few weeks the fair land of scotland would be returned into a region of desolation and as you may imagine everyone was paralyzed with terror at this awful calamity which threatened them the king <clears throat> called a solemn meeting of all his counselors, and he asked them if they could devise any way of warding off the danger. And for three days they sat in council. <clears throat> Sorry. And for three whole days they sat in council, these grave, bearded men. Many were su the suggestions <clears throat> which were made, and many the words of wisdom which were spoken. But alas, no one was wise enough to think of a way by which the Mester Storeworm could be driven back. At last, at the end of the third day, when everyone had given up hope of finding a remedy, the door of the council chamber opened. <clears throat> and the queen appeared. Now, the queen was the king's second wife. She was not a favorite in the kingdom, for she was a proud, insolent woman who did not behave kindly to her de stepdaughter, the princess Jem the Lovely, and who spent mu much more of her time in the company of a great sorcerer whom everyone feared and dreaded than she did in that of the king, her husband. And so the sober counselors looked at her disapprovingly as she came boldly into the council chamber and stood up beside the king's chair of state and speaking in a loud, clear voice addressed them thus. <clears throat> you think that you are brave men and strong. Oh, ye elders, and fit to be the protectors of the people. And so it may be when it is mortals that ye are called on to face, but ye be no match for the foe that now threatens our land. Before him your weapons be but as straw. Tis not through strength of arm, but through sorcery that he will be overcome. So listen to my words, even though they be of those of a woman, and take counsel with the great sorcerer, for whom nothing is hid, but who knoweth all the mysteries of the earth, and of the air, and of the sea. And now the king and his counselors liked not this advice, for they hated the sorcerer, who had, as they thought, too much influence with the queen. But they were at their wits' ends. They knew not to whom to turn for help, and so they were fain to do as she said, and summon the wizard before them. <clears throat> uh, 
And when he obeyed the summons and appeared in their midst, they liked him none the better for his looks, for he was long and thin and awesome with a beard that came down to his knee and hair that wrapped about him like a mantle and his face his face was the color of mortar as if he had always lived in darkness and had been afraid to look on the sun but there was no help to be found in any other man. So they laid the case before him and asked what they should do. And he answered coldly that he would think over the matter and come again to the assembly the following day to give them his advice. Give his advice he did. And his advice, when they heard it, it was like to turn their hair white with horror. For he said the only way to satisfy the monster and to make it spare the land was to feed it every Saturday with seven young maidens who must be the fairest who could be found. And if after this remedy had been tried once or twice, it did not succeed in mollifying the storeroom, in inducing him to depart, there was but one other measure that he could suggest, but that was so horrible and dreadful that he would not rend their hearts by mentioning it in the meantime. And as although they hated him, they feared him also, the council had in to buy by his words and pronounce this awful doom on the land. And so it came about, every Saturday, <clears throat> seven Bonnie, and I think everyone knows this, but Bonnie is, is a Scottish Gaelic word for beautiful. Seven Bonnie innocent maidens were bound hand and foot and laid on a rock which ran into the sea. And the monster stretched out his long, jagged tongue and swept them into his mouth, hollering as they went, while all the rest of the folk looked on, helpless from the top of a high hill, or at least the men looked, with cold, set faces while the woman hid theirs in their aprons and wept aloud. Is there no other way, they cried. No other way than this to save the land. But the men only groaned and shook their heads. No other way, they answered. No other way. Then suddenly a boy's indignant voice ran out amongst the crowd. Is there no grown man who'd fight that monster and kill him and save the lassies alive? I'd do it. I'm not afeard of the, for the master worm, store worm. And it was the boy as a paddle who spoke. And everyone looked at him in amazement as he stood staring at the great sea serpent, his fingers twitching with rage and his great blue eyes glowing with pity and indignation. The poor burns may mad. Um, burn just means child. It's not some Scottish version of barn. <laughs> Though that context probably gave you that. The poor burns mad. The sight hath turned his head, they whispered. Turned his head is sort of like... Not like turned his head to look. Like his, his head is swirling. He's lost his mind. <clears throat> they whispered one to the other, and they would have crowded round him to pet and comfort him. But his elder brother came and gave him a heavy clout on the side of the head. They have fight the store worm, he cried contemptuously. A likely story. Go home to thy ash pit and stop speaking havers. Havers, madness, foolishness, babbling. And taking his arm, he drew him to the place where his other brothers were waiting and they all went home together. <clears throat> 
But all the time, Master Paddle kept saying that he meant to kill the store worm. And at last, his brothers became so angry <clears throat> at what they thought was mere bragging that they picked up stones and pelted him so hard with them that at last he took to his heels and ran away from that evening, the six brothers were threshing corn in the barn, and Asapatl, as usual, was lying among the ashes, thinking his own thoughts, and when his mother came out and bade him run and tell the others to come in for their supper, the boy did as he was bid, for he was a willing enough little fellow, but when he entered the barn, his brothers, in revenge for having run away from them in the afternoon, set on him and pulled him down and piled so much straw on top of him that had his father not come from the house to see what they were all waiting for, he would have surety been smothered. But when at summer supper time, his mother was quarreling with the other lads for what they'd done and saying to them that it was only cowards who sat on barns littler and younger than themselves, Asipada looked up from the bicker of porridge which he was supping. Ax not thyself, mother, he said. For I could have fought them all if I liked. I ain't beaten them too. Why didn't thou say it then? cried everybody at once. Because I knew I'd need all my strength when I go to fight the giant storeroom, replied Asipatl gravely. And as you may fancy, the others, well, they laughed harder than before. Time passed, and every Saturday seven lassies were thrown to the store worm, until at last it was felt that this state of things could not be allowed to go on longer, for if it did, there would be no maidens at all left in the country. So the elders met once more, and after long consultation it was agreed that the sorcerer should be summoned, and asked what his other remedy was. For by our troth, said they, it cannot be worse than that which we are practicing now. But had they known it, the new remedy was even more dreadful than the old. For, as you'll recall, the cruel queen hated her stepdaughter, Jem the Lovely. And the wicked sorcerer knew that she did and that she would not be sorry to get rid of her. And things being as they were, he thought that he saw a way to please the queen. So he stood up in the council and pretending to be very sorry, said that the only other thing that could be done was to give the princess, Jim the Lovely, to the storeroom. <gasps> then would it have a surety depart, but... What an act he put on. And when the council heard this sentence, a terrible stillness fell upon them. Everyone covered his face <clears throat> with his hands, for no man dared look at the king. But although his dear daughter was the apple of his eye, he was a just and righteous monarch, and he felt that it was not right that other fathers should have been forced to part with their daughters in order to try and save the country if his child was to be spared. So after he had had a speech, the princess, he stood up before the elders and declared with trembling voice that both he and she were ready to make the sacrifice. She is my only child, he said, and the last of her race. And yet it seemeth good to both of us that she should lay down her life, if by doing so she may save the land that she loved so well. Salt tears ran down the faces of the great bearded men as they heard their king's words. For all, they all knew how dear the princess and the lovely was to him, but it was felt that what he said was wise and true and that the thing was just and right, for it were better, surely, that one maiden should die 
even though she were of royal blood, than that bands of other maidens should go to their death week by week, at all to no purpose. So amid heavy sobs, the aged lawman, who was the chief man of the council, rose up to pronounce the princess's doom, but ere he did so, the king's kember, or fighting man, stepped forward. Nature teaches us that it is fitting that each beast hath a tail, he said, and this doom which our lawman is about to pronounce is in very sooth a venomous beast. And if I had my way, the tail which it would bear after it <coughs> is this, that if the Meister Storeworm doth not depart, and that right speedily, after we have devoured the princess, the next thing that he is offered to him be no tender young maiden, but a tough, lean old sorcerer. And at his words, there was such a great shout of approval. Because <laughs> they just really hate him. That the wicked sorcerer seemed to shrink within himself, and his fa pale face grew paler than it was before. Now three weeks were allowed between the time that the doom was pronounced upon the princess and the time that it was carried out. Which, by the way, does that mean 21 maidens died? <clears throat> it's not clear. In just the time from this pronouncement. <clears throat> So that the king might send ambassadors to all the neighboring kingdoms to issue proclamations that if any champions would come forward who is able to drive away the storeworm and save the princess, he should have her for his wife. And with her, he should have the king, <clears throat> as well as a very famous sword that was now in the king's possession, but which had belonged to the great god Odin with which he had fought and vanquished all his foes. Which I think is this tale showing a bit of its Orcadian roots. The sword bore the name Sickersnapper and no man had any power against it the news of all these things spread over the length and breadth of the land and everyone mourned for the fate that was like to befall the princess Jim the lovely and the farmer and his wife and their six sons mourned also all but Hasapatl, who sat among the ashes and said nothing and when the king's proclamation was made known throughout the neighboring kingdoms there was a fine stir among all the young gallants, for it seemed but a little thing to slay a sea monster, and a beautiful wife in a fertile kingdom, and a trusty sword was not to be won every day. <clears throat> so, six and thirty champions arrived at the king's palace, each hoping to gain the prize. But the king sent them all out to look at the giant storeroom lying in the sea with its enormous mouth open. <sighs> and when they saw it, twelve of them were seized with sudden illness, and twelve of them were so afraid that they took to their heels and ran away and never stopped till they reached their own countries. And so only twelve returned to the king's palace and asked for them. They were so downcast at the thought of the task that they had undertaken that they had no spirit left in them at all. None of them dared try kill the storeroom. So the three weeks passed slowly by until the night before the day on which the princess was to be sacrificed. And on that night, the king, feeling that he must do something to entertain his guests, made a great supper for them. But as you may think, it was a dreary feast. For everyone was thinking about 
So much about the terrible thing that was about to happen on the morrow that no one could eat or drink. And when it was all over and everybody had retired to rest, save the king and his old Kempermen, the king returned to the great hall and went slowly up to his chair of state, high up on the dais. It was not <clears throat> like the chairs of state that we know nowadays. It was nothing but a massive kist in which he kept all the things which he trusted most. Kist is a uh, chest, so basically he just... His, throne was a treasure chest <clears throat> the old monarch undid the iron bolts with trembling fingers and lifted the lid and took out the wondrous sword sicker snapper which had belonged to the great god odin his trusty Kemperman, who had stood by him in a hundred fights watched him with Pitying eyes. Why lift ye out the sword, he said softly, when thy fighting days are done? Right nobly hast thou fought thy battles in the past, O oh, my lord. When thine arm was strong and sure, but when folks' years number four score and sixteen as time do, it is time to leave such work to other and younger men. The old king turned on him angrily with something of the old fire in his eyes. Least, he cried, hast thou turned his sword on thee? Dost thou think that I can see my only burn devoured by a monster and not lift a finger to try and save her when no other man will? I tell thee, and I will swear it with my two thumbs crossed on Sicker Snapper, that both the sword and I will be destroyed before so much as one of our hairs be touched. So go and thou love me, my old comrade, and order my boat to be ready with that sail set and the prow pointed out to the sea. I'll go myself and fight the storm, and if I do not return, I'll lay it on thee to guard my terrorist daughter. Peradventure my life may redeem hers. Now that night, everybody on the farm went to bed betimes, for next morning the whole family was to set out early and go to the top of the hill near the sea to see the princess eaten by the storm. All except a sepaddle who was to be left alone <clears throat> at home to herd the geese well the lad was so vexed at this for he had great schemes in his head that he could not sleep and as he lay tossing and tumbling about in his corner among the ashes he heard his father and mother talking in the great box bed and as he listened he found that they were having an argument "'Tis such a long way to the hill overlooking the sea. "'I fear me, I shall never walk it,' said his mother, "'and I think I'd better bide my time at home.' "'Nay,' hey, replied her husband, "'that would be a bonny-like thing. "'When all the countryside is to be there, "'thou shalt ride behind me on my good mare to go swift. "'I do not care to trouble thee to take me behind thee,' said his wife, "'for me thinks thou dost not love me as thou wert wont to do. "'Thou hey, woman's havering!' Climb, cried the good men of the house impatiently. And what makes me think that <clears throat> thee think that I have ceased to love thee? Because thou wilt no longer tell me thy secrets, answered his wife. To go no further to think of this very horse go swift. For five long years I've been begging you to tell me how it is that when thou rides there her, she flies faster than the wind, while if any other man mounts her, she hurples along like a broke down nag. The good man <clears throat> laughed. <laughs> "'Twas not for lack of love, good wife," he said. "'Though that might be lack of trust, for women's tongues wag but loosely, as if men's don't. <laughs> I did not want other folk to ken my secret, to know ken is no. <clears throat> but since my silence hath vexed thy heart, I'll even tell it thee. When I want to go swift to stand, I give her one clap on the left shoulder. And when I would have her go, like any other horse, I give her two claps on the right. But when I want her to fly like the wind, 
I whistle through the windpipe of a goose. And as I never can know <clears throat> when, <clears throat> I never can when I want her to gallop like that, I keep the bird's thrapple in the left hand pocket of my coat. <clears throat> so that is how the man is just the beast, said the farmer's wife in a satisfied tone. And what is it? What becomes of all my goose thrapples? <laughs> I have read this story before, but I missed that line before. <laughs> Apparently, because that's very fun. <laughs> oh, but how oh, what a clever fellow, Goodman. And now that I ken the, the way of it, I may go to sleep. Asapaddle was not tumbling about in the ashes. Now he was sitting up in the darkening, darkness with glowing cheeks and sparkling eyes. His opportunity had come at last, and he knew it. He waited patiently till their heavy breathing told him that his parents were asleep. And if the Scottish bloodline is to be trusted and persistent to today, that heavy breathing is what we would call sleep apnea. <laughs> then he crept over to where his father's clothes were and took the goose's windpipe out of the pocket of his coat and slipped noiselessly out of the house. And once he was out of it, he ran like lightning to the stable. He saddled and bridled, go swift, and threw a halter round her neck and led her to the stable door. The good mare, unaccustomed to her new groom, pranced and reared and plunged, but Hassapaddle, knowing his father's secret, clapped her once on the left shoulder, and as she stood still as a stone, then he mounted her and gave her two claps on the right shoulder, and the good horse trotted off briskly, without giving a loud neigh as she did so. The unwanted sound ringing out in the staleness of the night roused the household. <clears throat> and the goodman and his sons came cum tumbling down the wooden stairs and shouting to one another in confusion that someone was stealing Go Swift. The farmer was the first to reach the door, and when he saw in the starlight the vanishing form of his favorite steed, he cried at the top of his voice, Stop, thief! Who oh, Go Swift! Who? Oh! And when Go Swift heard that she was pulled up in a moment and all seemed lost for the former farmer and his sons could run very fast indeed and it seemed to ask a paddle sitting motionless on go swift's back that they would very soon make up for him but luckily he remembered the goose's thrapple and he pulled it out of his pocket and he whistled through it and in an instant the good mare bounded forward swift as the wind and was over the hill and out of the reach of its pursuers before they'd even taken ten steps more. The day was dawning when the lad came within sight of the sea and there in front of him <clears throat> in the water lay the enormous monster whom he'd come so far to slay. Anyone would have said he was mad even to dream of making such an attempt, for he was but a slim, unarmed youth, and the Mester Storeworm was so big that men said it would reach the fourth part of the world. And its tongue was jagged at the end like a fork, and with this fork it could sweep whatever it chose into its mouth and devour it at its leisure. For all this, Sassapattle was not afraid, for he had the heart of a hero underneath, and his tattered garments. I must be cautious, he said to himself, and do by my wits what I cannot do by my strength. He climbed down from his seat on Go Swiss' back and tethered the good steed to a tree, and walked on, looking well about him, till he came to a little cottage on the edge of a wood. Now the door was not locked, so he entered, and he found its occupants, an old woman, Fast asleep in bed. With that Scottish apnea. <laughs> he did not disturb her, and he took down an iron pot from the shelf and examined it closely. This will serve my purpose, he said, and surely the old dame would not grunge if she knew twas to save the princess's life. 
Then he lifted a live peat from the smoldering fire, fire <clears throat> and went his way. And down at the water's edge, he found the king's boat lying guarded by a single boatman, with its sails set and its prow turned in the direction of the master store worm. Ah, it's a cold morning, said Asaparo. Art thou not well nigh frozen sitting there? If thou wilt come on the shore and run about and warm thyself, I'll get on to the boat, guard it, till thou returnest. A likely story, replied the man. And what would the king say if he were to come, and as I expect every moment he will do, and find me playing myself on the land, and his good boat left to a smatch it like thee? Twould be as much as my head is worth. As thou wilt answered Asapaddle carelessly, beginning to search among the rocks. In the meantime, I must be looking for wee mussels for roast for my breakfast, to roast for my breakfast. And after he had gathered the mussels, he began to make a hole in the sand to put the live peat in. Well, the boatman watched curiously, for he too was beginning to feel hungry. Presently, the lad gave a wild shriek and jumped high in the air. Gold! Gold by the name of Thor! Who would have thought to find gold here? Well, this was too much for the gold boatman. Forgetting all about his head and the king, he jumped out of the boat, boat and pushing us a paddle aside, began to scrape among the sand with all his might. And there's a shot of the scene to come, so I won't say. <clears throat> And while he was doing so, Asapato seized his pot, jumped into the boat, and pushed off, pushed her off. He was a half mile out to sea before the outwitted man, who, needless to say, could find no gold, noticed what he was about. And of course, he was very angry, and the old king, <laughs> well, he was more angry still when he came down to the shore, attended by his nobles, and carrying the great sword Sticker Snapper, and in the vain hope that he the feeble old man that he was, might be able in some way to defeat the monster and save his daughter. But to make such an attempt was beyond his power now that his boat was gone, so he couldn't only stand on the shore along with a fast assembling crowd of his subjects and watch what would befall. And this is what befell. Asa paddle slowly sailing over the sea and watching the Mester store worm intently. Notice that the terrible monster yawned occasionally, as if longing for his weekly feast. And as it yawned, great floods of seawater went down its throat and came out again its huge gills. So the brave lad took down his sail and pointed the prow of his boat straight at the monster's mouth. And the next time it yawned, he and his boat were sucked right in like Jonah and went straight down into its throat, into the dark regions inside its body. If you don't know, Jonah's a reference to a Bible story. <clears throat> On and on the boat floated, but as it went, the water grew less and less, pouring out of the store worm's gills, till at last the boat stuck, as it were, on dry land. And Asaparo jumped out, his pot in hand, and began to explore. Presently he came to the huge creature's liver. Having heard that the liver of a fish is full of oil, he made a hole in and put in there the live peat fire. Woe is me, but there was a conflagration, and Asapaddle just got back to his boat in time for the Mester Storeworm in its convulsions, threw the boat right out of its mouth again, and it was flung up high and dry onto bare land. The commotion in the sea was so terrible that the king and his daughter, who by this time had come down to the shore dressed like a bride in white and ready to be thrown to the monster, and all his courtiers and all the country folk were 
were fain to take refuge on the hill top out of harm's way and stand and see what happened next. And this is what happened next. The poor distressed creature, for it was now to be pitied, even though it was a great cruel awful master storeworm, tossed itself to and fro, twisting and writhing. And as it tossed its awful head out of the water, its tongue fell out and struck the earth with such force that it made a great dint into it, into which the sea rushed. And that dint formed the crooked straits which now divide Denmark from Norway and Sweden. Then some of its teeth came loose and fell out, resting in the sea, and became the islands which we now call Orkney Isles. And a little afterwards, some teeth dropped out again, and they became what we now call the Shetland Isles. And after that, the creature twisted itself into a great big lump, shuddering and dying. And this lump became the island of Iceland. And the fire which Asabadal had kindled with his live peat still burns underneath that island. And that is why there are mountains which throw out fire in the chilly land of Iceland. When at last it was plainly seen that the Mester Storworm was dead, the king could scarce contain himself with joy. He put his arms around Asabadal's neck and kissed him. A commoner. He's a king. He kissed him and he called him his son. <clears throat> and he took off his royal mantle and he put it on the lad, unheard of, and girded his good sword, sicker snapper, round his waist. And he called his daughter, the princess, Jem the lovely to him, and put her hand in his and declared that when the right time came, she should be his wife and uh, that he should be ruler over all <clears throat> the kingdom. Then the whole company mounted their horses again, and Asapadal rode on go swift by the prince's side. And so they returned with great joy to the king's palace. But as they were nearing the gate, Asapadal's sister, she who was the princess's maid, ran out to meet him and signed to the princess to lout down and whispered something in her ear and the princess's face grew dark. She turned her horse's head and rode back to where her father was with his nobles and she told him the words that the maiden had spoken and when he heard them his face too grew as black thunder. For the matter was this. The cruel queen, full of joy at the thought that she was to be rid once and for all of her stepdaughter, had been making love to the wicked sorcerer all the morning in the old king's absence. He shall be killed at once. Such behavior cannot be overlooked. Thou wilt. Have much ado to find him, your majesty, said the girl, for tis more than an hour since he and the queen fled together on the fleetest horse, horses that they could find in the stables. But I can find him, cried us a paddle, and off he went like the wind on his good horse, go swift, of course, with a blow of the goose's thrapple. <laughs> it was not long before he came within sight of the fugitives riding high along <clears throat> the land and he drew his sword and he shouted to them to stop they heard the shout and turned around and they both <laughs> laughed out loud in derision when they saw that it was only a boy who groveled in the ashes who pursued them thin and pathetic <sighs> the insolent brat I'll cut off his head for him and I'll teach him a lesson, cried the sorcerer. And he rode boldly back to meet Asapadal. And, you know, just to pick out his logic here, you don't learn a lot of lessons when you don't have a head. <clears throat> for although he was no fighter, he knew that no ordinary weapon could harm his enchanted body and therefore he was not afraid. But he did not count on Asapadal having the sword of the great god Odin with which he had slain all his enemies, and before this magic weapon, he was powerless. And at one thrust, 
The young lad ran through his body as easily as if he had been any ordinary man and drew him off his horse, throwing him to the ground, dead. Then the courtiers of the king, who had also set off in pursuit, but whose steeds were less fleet of foot than go swift, came up and seized the bridle of the queen's horse and led it and its rider back to the palace. And she was brought before the council and judged and condemned to be shut up in a high tower for the remainder of her life, which thing surely came to pass. As for Asapatl, when the proper time came, he married the princess Gem the Lovely. With great feasting and rejoicing. And when the old king died, they ruled the kingdom for many a long year. And that is the story of us, a paddle and the Mr. Storeworm. <clears throat> um, I, I, Jump Story has picked up on the thing that really stood out for me, as much as it is overall a, an excellent tale, um, I think for any generation, really. Uh, I don't think you even need to make many allowances for it to be old like you do with some of them. Uh, it's been a while since I've heard a fairy tale that doubled as a mythology for the origins of certain countries and lands, and that is indeed what stood out for me. Um, <clears throat> Because that is one of my favorite things. Um, <laughs> Lizzie Rose is saying, anyone else getting autism vibes from Massa Paddle? Uh, I mean, he's definitely unique, as all heroes are. And I noticed that there was a, a, a suggestion here that many heroes of old were... Nero spicy in some regard. I, I think there might be some truth to that. I mean, at the end of the day, they wouldn't have had any kind of context for such things, but I think it's worth saying that um, heroes were always unique. Uh, Zombie Wolf says, random trivia, the pyramids of Egypt existed in the same time as woolly mammoths, though definitely not in the same area. <laughs> Yeah, actually, I, I think I did know that. Um, but it is an excellent piece of trivia. I think um, I think we really don't appreciate how old the pyramids are. <laughs> um, uh, because I don't know how we as a species can really understand stretches of times like that. Um, Tammy says, thank you everyone for a great chat tonight. It was very informative. I'm afraid I missed a lot of it. It was a very occupying story. See you all Thursday. I hope you have sweet dreams. Good night, Rory. Thank you, Tammy. Jump Story says, good stories. Night, everyone. I'm glad you liked them, Jump Story. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, um, I don't know if there's any questions I missed. Just making sure there's nothing obvious. I see Tammy said... Oh, Tammy likes that I use my hands. You know, I noticed I, it took me about six months of doing this before I realized that there's only really two things you can see. My face and my hands, and I wasn't using my hands, so I, I uh, started using my hands more. <clears throat> I don't think I don't think there's any pressing questions. Um, uh, Lizzie Rose says uh, origin stories like this are called etiologies. Well, I mean, I know etymology is also an origin, but that's a specific word. So I guess that makes sense. No, I didn't know that, though. Uh, but I can see the etymology of etiology. <laughs> well, you know, I got a type five that all goes that way. Why is anyone watching this nonsense? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I appreciate how full-throated and interesting that story was. 
Um, and now you can tell everyone that, you know, it's not Cinderella until there's bloodied feet. <laughs> But uh, I like the idea that the story of my history becomes people that grew up on basically a sea dragon's teeth and floated across the sea to become lumberjacks. Um, anyways, it's enough of my babbling. We've obviously gone a bit long for this uh, stream, but I uh, certainly hope you guys enjoyed the tales. It seems like you did. I'm glad you did. Um, they have all that Scottish high drama, but also the Scottish pacing, which tends to be a little more long in the tooth, uh, or I should say long in the tongue. Um, <clears throat> but um, I certainly enjoyed reading them, and I appreciate everybody who came here and uh, hung out with me tonight around my little fireside. And of course, I will keep the fire warm. You have a good sleep. <laughs>